to everybody. Welcome to the Richard L. Thompson Lecture Series, second session, well, third session. Mm -hmm. Third session. Uh, my name is Chris Norris. I'll be the MC for today. I'm filling in for Leela. Um, this is the second of an ongoing lecture series based on the books of Richard L. Thompson, Sataputta Das. Um, we're going to be covering Sataputta's six major works, starting with his first book, Mechanistic and Non-Mechanistic Science. In the first session on February 4th, Brahmatirtha discussed the introduction where Sataputta explains that although the current mechanistic worldview implies that everything is a machine made of matter, Bhakti Yoga goes beyond modern science by developing higher cognitive powers that lie dormant in the conscious self. In session two, Parashottam Goel Paramakaruna spoke on chapter one, searching past the mechanics of perception, which reveals that although modern life sciences have made the bold claim that all life can be explained by physics and chemistry, even thinking, feeling, and willing, they still have not been able to explain consciousness. I am now pleased to introduce Partha Biswas Parma Rupa, who will give a presentation on chapter two, Thinking Machines and Psychophysical Parallelism. Partha is a director at MathWorks with a bachelor's from the Indian Institute of Technology and a PhD from the University of California, Irvine. He also serves as a spiritual advisor for Northeastern University, a chaplain at Brandeis University, and as a certified meditation trainer with divine mindfulness. And with that, I will hand it over to Partha. Thank you so much uh, for your kind and generous introduction. Let me try to share my screen. Thank you. Just hold on one second. I hope you can see the screen. Yep. Yep. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyanan Jana Shilagya Chakshur Anmilita Mayana Tasmani Shri Guru Namaha. I seek blessings from all of you to be able to represent His Grace Sadhguru Prabhu properly, because um, without His blessings, I don't think I'm in a position to, to properly represent the profound uh, teachings that he had presented in his book, Mechanistic and Non-Mechanistic Science. So let's start with this um, sh very short video. And welcome to MIT 6S191, the official introductory course on deep learning taught here at MIT. Deep learning is revolutionizing so many fields, from robotics to medicine and everything in between. You'll learn the fundamentals of this field and how you can build some of these incredible algorithms. In fact, this entire speech and video are not real and were created using deep learning and artificial intelligence. And in this class, you'll learn how. And welcome. Actually, you're not going to learn how, but actually, our goal is to um, get into the chapter two of the mechanistic and non mechanistic science where. We will learn how a conscious experience cannot just be synthesized by mechanistically driven approach to create a sentient computer. The title here, Thinking Machines and Psychophysical Parallelism, capture very effectively the content of this presentation. And you will see how they are coming through. The agenda for today, um, we are going to first try to understand what does it take to conceive a sentient computer. And then uh, we will jump into some non-mechanistic models. And if time permitting, we'll look into the contemporary AI, particularly deep learning, and see whether the arguments that are presented are still valid. And finally, we'll try to wrap up with the Vedic alternative, which is going to provide a satisfactory understanding of this whole thing. So overall, the picture um, is going to increasingly, the picture is going to become increasingly clear what accounts for our conscious experience of thoughts and feelings. So let's begin with exploring a mechanistic approach. 
So ultimately, we are trying to solve the problems of old age and death. So a mechanistic approach um, attempts to take advantage of the idea that a human being is essentially a complex machine. In fact, the strong AI proponents would say an accurate simulation of a human mind is actually a mind. So in the past few years, the artificial intelligence uh, has been a subject of intense media hype. And also there had been tremendous amount of benefits that um, have been derived particularly in recent times with the um, introduction of automated driving and then many advanced medical research where uh, some of the problems which were very difficult to solve are getting solved with the help of the modern AI techniques. So machine learning, deep learning, and AI, they come in countless articles, often outside of technologically minded publications. And we are promised a future of intelligent chatbots, self-driven cars, virtual assistants, and um, a future sometimes painted in a harsh way and other times as hyperbole, where human jobs will be scarce and most economic activity will be handled by robots or AI agents. So how did it all, got, uh, all get started? So artificial intelligence overall is an effort to automate um, intellectual tasks, uh, which are normally performed by humans. So it all started in 1956 when John McCarthy, a professor from Dartmouth College, he organized a summer workshop under the following proposal. The study is to proceed on the basis of, a, of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to uh, simulate it. An attempt will be made, an attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kind of problems now reserved for humans and improve themselves. And we think that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if we carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. So this was the proposal under which um, they tried to generate something out of a summer. And at the end of the summer, the workshop concluded without having fully solved the riddle, it set to investigate. Nevertheless, it set in motion an intellectual revolution that is still ongoing to this day. So at least this gives you a historical perspective. So Sadhubhuta Prabhu, uh, in his book, he introduces this whole idea of conceiving a sentient computer with the help of the computerized Mr. Jones, who is trying to escape death. So in a typical scene, doctors and technicians, they are scanning the head of the dying Samuel Jones with a cerebroscope, a highly sensitive instrument that records in full detail the synaptic connections of the neurons in his brain. So all of a sudden, um, the, the character jumps out by exulting, I'm, I have escaped death. And, and then um, we can understand what's going on is that a computer uh, systematically transforms um, this information into a computer program that is faithfully simulating the brain's particular activity, uh, particular pattern of internal activity. And so this program is running on a suitable computer and the personality of Mr. Jones uh, seems to come to life with the help of the machine. So it's interesting to note how Sadhaputta Prabhu puts it. He says that, that while scanning the room with uh, stereoscopically mounted um, TV cameras, this computerized Mr. Jones appears to somewhat uh, be disoriented in this new kind of embodiment. And he displays the traits of Mr. Jones in complete detail, but his only problem is figuring out um, how to avoid being erased from the computer memory. So some of the the most influential thinkers of the world uh, has taken this basic principle behind it very seriously. And they started conceiving of a human personality in mechanistic terms. 
So there are different, different departments. They just approach it in a slightly different way, but the underlying principle still remains the same. The life sciences would say that a living being is nothing more than a highly complex machine built from molecular components. A person coming from psychology would be more concerned with the mind. And they would say mind involves nothing more than a biophysical functioning of the brain. And a person coming from philosophy would um, try to explain away in this way that one can define in entirely mechanistic terms, the words like consciousness, perception, meaning, purpose, and intelligence. And there had been some really strong quotes um, and things have gone much more beyond mere speculations about the construction of machines that can exhibit these traits of functionality. So Richard Dawkins famously said that we are surviving survival machines, uh, robo vehicles, blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. Um, long time ago, maybe 50 years ago or more than 50 years ago, uh, Marvin Minsky, a well-known professor from MIT, he wrote that the, a machine will soon be created with the general intelligence of an average human being. The machine will be able to educate itself in a few months it will be at a genius level. And then he adds, if you're lucky, they may decide to keep us as pets. So the advent of modern electronic computers has given us a new field of scientific investigation dedicated to actually building such machines. And this basically enters in the field of cognitive engineering in which the, the scientists are under the assumption that with sufficient speed and complexity of the digital processors, um, all these complexities that are associated with the aspects of conscious personality can be fully represented uh, with this high powered machines. In fact, um, Professor Arthur Harkins uh, from University of Minnesota, he says that by the year 2000, people will be getting married to robots and society will begin to ponder the definition of human. Now, obviously, we have to understand the cognitive engineering involves an approach uh, to the subject of mind and intelligence, which is quite different from those of the philosophers and psychologists. How? The cognitive engineers, they are actually trying to produce intelligence. So we are going to see some uh, effort in that direction. So now at this point, let's just think, if we were to work on creating a sentient computer, how would we work on such a thing? So what is a sentient computer? Sentient computer is a hypothetical computer that possesses intelligence and conscious awareness. So two things, intelligence, oh, this is wrong pen. It possesses intelligence and also conscious awareness. Um, on a human level. And we will assume, therefore, derived from this, that it will have awareness of thoughts, feelings, sensory perceptions that are comparable to our own. Okay. So that's what um, is the definition of the sentient computer. So let us now briefly examine what would take to... Um, to build such a sentient machine. But before you can step into that, we have to understand how does a computer work fundamentally? So uh, Sadhguru Prabhu makes an interesting statement that it belongs to the species of digital computers, um, which consists of three things primarily, the central processing unit, the memory, and the IO devices. So let me just try to uh, see if I can paint this picture. Um, so we can actually draw these arrows to indicate that this is the central unit and for receiving inputs from the user, these are the peripheral devices uh, and likewise for throwing outputs in front of the user, um, these peripheral devices are used. And then for computer um, CPU unit to function, it needs to utilize um, both instruction and data memory, okay? So what you see behind is actually a real 
uh, Simulink model of um, a processor. And uh, what you can see is that, that this processor can be conceived of in many different ways, but the fundamental um, logical arrangements of these components are what is determining the functioning of the CPU. So I just wanted to give a quick refresher or either refresher or an introduction to the computer, how it would look like. So as I mentioned, we are dealing with a central processing unit called CPU, which is basically the, the you can say the brain of the computer. And, and then that is interacting with the, the IO devices and it is interacting with the, the memory. And this memory is of two kinds. It can be the instruction memory where the instructions to be executed on the computer are getting stored. So in instructions, so there is instruction memory and then there is the data memory. So while you are executing the instructions, the data that are getting processed, they get stored into the data memory. Now these instructions obviously are at a very low level. They are either, uh, you can say, considered to be assembly, or you can say just the, um, the byte level code, you know? So, so now what happens is that the CPU has got many stages. It has got stages like this. It has got fetch. Uh, so before I describe, so generally when we say CPU, this particular box, um, essentially is made up of two basic things. One is called the data path. And the second is the instruction set architecture. So data path is um, encapsulating the typically what is called the pipeline stage, the pipeline through which the, the instruction flow through the system and, and actually make the, the data crunch in the specific execution units. So typically a, a CPU is made up of a pipeline of stages. So this is the fetch, there's the decode, then there is the execution, execution where the, you can say arithmetic and logical units are there. And then there is the, um, the memory related operations and then there is a write back. So what's happening is that the instruction set architecture defines uh, different varieties of instructions that can get executed by the CPU. And they generally cap capture in the form of some, these are, you can say, some kind of um, encapsulation of the operation. Like, for example, if you have to do add operation, it will say add, and then it can say, for example, dollar one, dollar two, dollar three. So the, here, add is an opcode, and then this is going to be followed by operands or the things that it is working on. So the operands are generally fetched from what is called the register files. So register files is where the operations, uh, the operands are, are generally stored. So execution unit directly um, works on the register file um, by um, operating using the opcode and then it actually stores the result and it's getting written back into the register file. So, so this add, what is this add operation denoting? So that needs to be the dec uh, that needs to be decoded before knowing which part of the, the execution unit can actually um, operate on those instructions. So this uh, gives you at least a basic framework to understand now um, the activity of a computer. So, so the, the computer, as you can see, is going through the repeated um, execution of very simple operations. And those simple operations is what I was calling part of the instruction set of architecture. So these are supposed to be very simple in nature. All right. So this whole operations of the computer, you can say, um, 
is fundamentally based on the on the thesis by Church, who said that any scheme of symbol manipulation can be precisely defined. Um, uh, any kind of symbolic manipulation that can be precisely defined can be carried out by a digital computer of modern type. So, what happens in in uh, when you are trying to um, envision such a system? You first actually conceptualize what you are trying to um, what you are trying to create. Like in this case, suppose you want to create a square root operation. Okay, the specific operations are going to be executed um, by the instruction codes. They are initially stored in the uh, passive memory record. That is what I was referring to as the instruction memory. And the function of the CPU is to simply carry um, the execution of those simple operations um, uh, in a sequential manner. Now, just like memory, the CPU can be constructed physically out of many, many different kinds of components. Um, but the functioning of the CPU is determined by the, the logical arrangement of these components. Uh, not necessarily by the, the physical constitution. So let's see how you uh, can see the human computer interaction is uh, happening here. So humans may conceptualize the square root operations. It's very easy for us to think at this highest abstraction level. So this is the highest abstraction level. And then in order to um, go down to the uh, level of the computer, which is only capable of executing very simple instructions, the the conceptualization that is there at the highest abstraction level has to be brought to, to a lower level, where we can express, start expressing at a an algorithmic steps level. That in order to find the square root of of x, what steps are you going to do, take at a high level? So this is still at a high level. This is still not uh, at the level at which the computer can understand, and therefore. Um, generally, this, uh, this, these algorithm st algorithmic steps, they are expressed um, in the form of high-level programming languages like C, C++, Java, and all these uh, modern languages. Okay, and, and it is understood that every fixed scheme of computation that has ever been formulated can be reduced to a list of simple operations of the kind that is used in this example. So from here, what happens is that these high-level the algorithmic steps which are expressed in, let's say, C, C++ or any such high-level language, then further gets converted into lower level at the level at which the computer or the CPU can understand is uh, that that job is generally done by what is called compiler. Okay, So when compiler actually turns these high-level algorithmic steps into low level, you can consider these to be like assembly instructions. So here, the steps that are written here, this write zero in, in two, if I were to encapsulate in the form of the opcode operand notation that I was uh, referring to in the previous um, slide, I would put like this. Uh, this is going to be, sorry, not move. This is going to be, let's say, load immediate, okay? Into some register, let's say dollar, dollar one and the value zero. So this is the, uh, the assembly instruction that would correspond to write zero in two. So Sadhapada Prabhu is doing a brilliant job in trying to um, help who may not actually be conversant with the assembly language to still appreciate how does the instructions, uh, how do the instructions look like at the at the lowest possible level at which the computer can understand. So if you can see here, li this um, this lowest level, uh, this is what is referred to as opcode, and these are referred to as the operands. And likewise, the increment, right? So it's saying that that whatever is stored, so if I have to faithfully uh, use this two, if I want to call these one, two, three, four, five, um, this can be considered to be part of the register file, okay? Because um, generally when we talk about storage, the storage can be memory, the storage can be register file. So if I refer to these as dollar two, dollar three, dollar four, and dollar five, and if I have to just correspondingly write, I would write dollar two here, okay? Because it corresponds to this cell. So it's saying that you write zero into this cell, and then you increment whatever is there in that cell. 
So which means that it would be add, okay? It would be add immediate, okay? For example, dollar two, okay? Your add immediate dollar two, dollar two, and with ones. So you're adding one to dollar two and then storing into dollar two. So I'm just giving you an example of how each of these steps corresponds to an assembly instruction, which is basically going to go through um, each of these stages, each of these stages. So now with the help of that example, you can see that here, when you are encountering load immediate, uh, let's take the example of, let's say, add immediate, and then followed by dollar two, dollar two, and then one. So this fetch stage is simply fetching from the instruction memory. So instruction memory contains, this instruction memory contains all the instructions in, in the sequential order, the assembly instructions. So the fetch stage is getting the instruction one by one. And then the decode stage is splitting them apart. That what is opcode, what is operand. So it's figuring out. So now based on the decoding of this opcode, it figures out that this is an add operation. So then it sends to the corresponding execution unit, which is capable of performing the add operation. And therefore, once the instruction gets dispatched to the respective execution unit, and then because these execution units are, are also connected with the register file, they would be able to fetch this dollar one, you know, and would be able to add one to it because of the functionality that is expressed through the decode stage. And after that, because in this case, there is no memory involved. So this, skip, this stage will be skipped. And then the write back stage would then write back to the register file, which because it is it needs to write back that into the dollar two location. So I wanted to give you uh, an understanding of uh, when Sadhguru Prabhu is is showing these uh, boxes, what exactly they correspond to. So they correspond to the different registers uh, in the register file. All right. So therefore, uh, typically this is expressed in a target specific assembly language. In other words, the compiler's job is to simply translate these high level algorithmic steps into the machine specific instructions. And there can be so many different kinds of underlying machines. It can be an Apple computer, it can be an Intel. I mean, um, these days, um, Apple has moved to some other processor. My point is that there could be uh, so many different underlying processor, uh, which has its own set of defined assembly instruction. So the compiler's job is really to map to those target specific assembly language. So I hope you, you get this picture. Okay, now having understood the, um, understood this basic idea of how a computer works, now you can understand where Sadhguru Prabhu is leading us here. So, so now he's basically taking these three steps. So first try to understand that the intricate behavior behavioral characteristic of a human being can be completely described as a highly complex scheme of symbol manipulation. Because this is the assertion of all the, the modern um, AI proponents, as well as the, um, as, as I mentioned, the psychologists, as well as the, the philosophers. But here we are dealing with the cognitive engineers who wants to represent um, the conscious behavior of a human being. Right. So now we are we are trying to shift gear here. That what if the computer that we just described, we want to add the sentient dimension to it, where it should also be become aware of what is going on. You know. So so now the intricate behavior behavioral characteristics is what we are able to observe in a human being. Right. Anyone can can see what on a regular basis a human being is is doing, it's, it's just comprised of so many uh, complex tasks. So these complex tasks, but are nothing but symbolic manipulation, right? So therefore, according to Church's thesis, that scheme can be broken down into a program of instructions. And then, then the question is that, where is that conception coming that this program will have to be exceedingly long and complex, right? and may run to even millions of steps in order to uh, mimic the behavior of a human being. 
but it is a fact that no one has even come close to actually producing a formal symbolic description of human behavior. And then obviously a doubt should be raised in our mind at this point that if we were to simulate the experience of the day-to-day -day human behavior with the help of such a computer, we see that it is just a manipulation of some inactive records that is going on, which has nothing to do with consciousness. So where can the consciousness of the computer really reside, even if we were to um, think about such a thing? Because if you see that uh, one of the instructions that we saw that it involves copying a data or copying a datum from one location into another. In what way can this be correlated with the conscious perception of thoughts and feelings? So now, so now let us suppose that a highly complex program of this kind is actually being executed by a computer. And let us see what we can understand about the computer's possible state of consciousness. Okay, so now we are going to um, start building this picture of this hypothetical sentient computer. Now that we have uh, we have seen how a general computer works, now we want to see how can a conscious computer work, okay? So you can see that at the lowest level, we have got the computer hardware. This is what I was referring to as the, the data path, right? Which is ba basically made up of different uh, hardware components. And the lowest level, they are essentially some switching transistors. Um, so ultimately they are, they are just some wiring going on of, um, on some, com of some components. Okay. So now you can see that at the lowest level, when we were, um, issuing one particular instruction to, uh, one execution unit, as we saw with that example, that it is executing an elementary operation like add, right? It is doing add operation. Okay. Now that add operation is a very small unit of operation, but it is in a context of something else. Just like we saw from a human's perspective, they are trying to um, implement the functionality of a square root, right? But at the computer's level, it is just working on the smallest possible um, level of operation. So now as you go higher and higher, you can see that uh, the generally there is uh, there is a successive level of mathematical procedure of greater and greater intricacy and sophistication. They come into picture uh, when it comes to our own thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. So when we are presented with just those assembly instructions, they don't resonate with us at all. Right? So now, so if we assume that a computer has a subjective experience comparable to our own, then the computer's awareness of thoughts and feelings must be needed, real. And these thoughts and feelings can only correspond to these higher order abstract properties of the computer program. So when a computer is just executing an elementary operation, we don't see there is any consciousness getting synthesized there. And they are part of a higher operation. And then that is part of a more sophisticated mathematical procedure. And ultimately, uh, from our perspective, when we are becoming more and more aware of the big picture of what is going on, ultimately, we are needing to uh, become conversant with the higher order abstract properties of the computer program. And these properties, they exist only in an abstract sense and they are not actually present in the computer's hardware. So the point is that these properties, they are not existing in the computer hardware anywhere. But if you, if you look at how exactly the computer is uh, executing instruction, all the activities are just going at this level, at this uh, lower most level. While the consciousness is consciousness as well as the subjective experience, typically happens at the highest abstraction level. And therefore we are, when it comes to um, synthesizing a sentient computer, we are more interested in um, understanding the um, 
the synthesis of the higher order abstract properties of the computer's program. So now, if we take that, um, that computer hardware and just replace with the brain hardware, nothing really changes, isn't it? Because brain hardware, it just made up of different kind of physical and chemical constitution. But here also at the lowermost level, there are some basic neural operations happening. But then our interaction is always at the, uh, at the level of thoughts, feelings, perceptions. So they correspond to higher order abstract properties of the brain states. And since these abstract properties have no concrete existence and are only relatable in a very indirect way with the physical structure of the brain, how can they actually correspond to the person's actual conscious experience? So, so therefore, we are at this point um, needing to conclude that we need to have the presence of another entity which is capable of extracting out the abstract properties out of these um, lower operations that are going on. And it, at this point, it is important to point out this idea that a sentient being can be adequately characterized by a mathematical description of its physical states or a suitable computer program is in fact functionalism in the world of philosophy. And this is also uh, sometimes referred to as behaviorism. All right. So what is consciousness? So by consciousness, we are referring to the awareness of thoughts, sensations that we directly perceive and we know that we are perceiving. And therefore, um, we can understand that according to the artificial intelligence researchers, um, these, this consciousness should correspond to the higher order abstract properties of the, the co computer's physical states. Um, and the properties which are meant to be described by symbols such as thoughts and feelings, which really stand on the top of um, an extensive pyramid of abstract definitions. So the conscious experience of the computer exists. Um, its subjective experience of the colors, sound, thoughts, feelings is an actual reality. Um, on the other hand, the physical structure of the computers, they also exist. However, they cannot directly relate to the consciousness with the concrete physical processes of the computer and nor can it relate to the execution of the individual elementary operations. So, but then we look at objectively, the consciousness is an objective feature of reality that tends to be associated with certain material structures such as the bodies of the living beings. So since the consciousness is real, but the abstract properties are not, we can only conclude that something must exist in nature that can somehow read these properties from the physical states of the computer. And that entity must satisfy these two properties. This is the, the most important point that comes out from this chapter. The two properties that this, this entity must satisfy is that first, it should be able to recognize the highly abstract patterns of organization in arrangements of matter. And secondly, it should be able to modify the content of conscious experience in accordance with the changes these abstract properties undergo as time passes and matter is transformed. So in other words, there is another entity which is capable of uh, recognizing these higher order or higher abstract um, patterns of organization within the, the low level organization of matter. That's basically one directional, um, you know, transmission of information. And then likewise, it should be able to also modify the, the content of the conscious experience, which means that it should also go in this direction. 
So the influence should be able to go in both the directions. So clearly there is no place for such an entity in this kind of the picture of what is going on in the computer. And therefore it must correspond to some feature of nature that is completely unknown to modern science. And, and this doesn't change at all, even when we are replacing the computer hardware with the brain hardware. The reader of the high order properties is needed. Is there a question? Okay. So at this point, the question arises that is there, um, is it possible for a machine to possess a conscious self? So, so naturally, uh, we want to know whether somebody has attempted to do such a thing. So indeed, there are actually uh, several researchers that have um, tried to create a faithful simulation of the, the brain hardware, so to speak. And one such, um, one such work is what is even presented in the TED Talk more than 10 years ago by Henry Markman, Markram. Um, this is an attempt to create a software simulation of the brain connections. If you remember, I started this presentation talking about the strong AI proponents who think that a, a software simulation of the mind is actually the mind. So this is a long uh, video, just but I wanted to give you a glimpse of how it looks like when they try to do such a thing. So I will go to a particular place. Um, a computer, because they know how to take 10,000 laptops and put it into the size of a refrigerator. So now we have this blue gene supercomputer. We can load up all the neurons onto each one onto its processor and fire it up and see what happens. Take the magic carpet for a ride. Here we activate it, and this gives the first glimpse of what is happening in your brain when there's a stimulation. It's the first view. Now, when you look at that the first time, you think, my God, how is reality coming out of that? But in fact, you can start, even though we haven't trained this neocortical column to create a specific reality, but we can ask, where is the rose? We can ask, where is it inside? If we stimulate it with a picture, where is it inside the neocortex? Ultimately, it's got to be there if we stimulated it with it. So the way that we can look at that is to ignore the neurons, ignore the synapses, and look just at the raw electrical activity, because that's what it's creating. It's creating electrical patterns. So when we did this, we indeed, for the first time, saw these ghostly-like structures electrical objects appearing within the neocortical column. And it's these electrical objects that are holding all the information about whatever stimulated it. And then when we zoomed into this, it's like a veritable universe. So the next step is just to take these brain coordinates and to project them into perceptual space. And if you do that, you would be able to step inside the reality that is created by this machine, by this piece of the brain. So, in summary, I think that the universe may have, it's possible, has... So, um, so you might wonder where this project is landing up today. So I actually did um, a bit of search to find out that this actually, this human brain project hasn't lived up to its promise 10 years later. And there is a link to this. You can look at, um, look into this. And that is very clear because uh, we just saw to produce the, the conscious experience that, that conceptualizing that rose that he was showing at the low level arrangement of matter, it's just not possible because we are needing the, the existence of that separate entity which can read the higher order properties of uh, the low level operations. 
So the overall behavior of the computer can be analyzed as conscious um, in terms of these properties, whereas any singular elementary operation would be too short to qualify. So generally the question arises that how can we say something is conscious? So, so generally a sequence of behavioral events will have to be quite long in order to merit the designation conscious. And with um, such a criterion, one might want to designate a certain sequence of computer operations as conscious because it possesses certain abstract abstract higher order properties. So all attempts to dis describe consciousness within this basic framework of modern science must lead to the same problems that we have encountered in our analysis of machine consciousness. And therefore, our assertion is that the sub entity of the kind that was described in the statements one and two, these one and two, will be required to account for consciousness. Yet in the present theoretical system of science, there is nothing to be found either in the brain or in a digital computer that corresponds to such an, such an entity. So while the computers may in principle generate complex sequences of behavioral um, replication comparable to those produced by human beings, um, computers cannot possess conscious awareness uh, without the intervention of principles of nature higher than those of the modern uh, science. So now let's look at the non-mechanistic theories. So over the years, uh, philosophers have developed a number of non-mechanistic uh, theories to account for our conscious experience of thoughts and feelings. So some theories are not compatible with the mechanistic assumptions of modern science and others have been specifically designed to somehow supplement them without necessarily contradicting them. So these are the theories that, uh, these are non-mechanistic theories that, are, that consider consciousness to be real. Um, so identity theory posits that both conscious mental experience and physical phenomena are real. However, mental and neural events are one and the same, and they are basically physical. So that's identity theory. The dual aspect theories, and one of the prominent ones is uh, known as Spinoza's uh, dual aspect theory. It says that there is one underlying substance that has both, so one underlying substance that has both physical and psychological aspects. And this overall area belongs to what is also known as panpsychism, which basically says that all physical objects are to some extent uh, sentient. That's their basic idea. So in other words, they are trying to seek the, the sentient behavior within matter. Now, this psychological, uh, sorry, psychophysical parallelism is something that is um, moving closer and closer to reality, uh, where the consciousness and, and material phenomena are real and are correlated to one another in a one on one fashion uh, without any uh, causal connection. So, now this is where it is uh, somewhat sort of unsatisfactory, that they are correlated to one another and yet without any causal connection. So the common feature of all these theories is that they all um, profess a direct one-on-one -on -one correlation between the contents of consciousness and the material phenomena. So they maintain one of these three. First is either they consider two things to be identical, or they consider um, there is a third thing, or they think that they somehow run in parallel. But unfortunately we saw that there is no one-to-one -one correlation between the contents of consciousness and the physical phenomena in the brain or the computer hardware. Um, then there are theories that consider consciousness explicitly to be different from the body. And there are three of them, the idealism, interactionism, and epiphenomenalism. Epiphenomenalism. So idealism basically says that only conscious minds have actual existence and that physical objects are nothing but mental perceptions. 
So this implies that the neurons in our brains must be also uh, perceptions. Then the question arises, in what mind are the perceptions? Because it's hard to see how the neurons in my brain could be perceptions in my own mind. Uh, because I do not have any direct awareness of them. On the other hand, if the perceptions are there in somebody else's mind, then the individual con conscious self must be distinct from the brain. So that's the argument that Sadhaputta Prabhu makes in the book. Um, so now, interactionism and epiphenomenalism of uh, phenomenalism is basically um, are, you can say, closer to our understanding of the Bhagavad Gita um, presentation of conscious self in the sense that they are both actually um, uh, showing that the, uh, the consciousness can get influenced or the consciousness can actually read out the information from the low level um, properties of matter. So at least from that perspective, these are, um, you can say, uh, supporting the theory that we just came up, came up with, that you need another entity which can read out the, the abstract properties um, out of physical arrangements of matter. Now, the difference between interactionism and epiphenomenalism is basically in the, in the way the consciousness in turn influences the body or not. So interactionism allows the consciousness to influence the body and the conscious self receives sense impressions from the, the neural apparatus of the brain and is able to exert its will on the body by inducing changes in the neural activity. But epiphenomenalism does not allow consciousness to influence the body. The conscious self is simply a passive spectator of events um, that are conducted entirely by physical processes. So this is just kind of an overview of what other non-mechanistic theories exist in order to explain away the conscious behavior. Um, so now at this point, the question may come that, okay, AI has advanced quite a bit now. We are in the realm of deep learning. And we just saw in the beginning how it has become such a, uh, so sophisticated that, that we are able to utilize data to, to now um, uh, provide enough um, information for the compute, the machines to actually learn. So therefore, uh, does anything change from the standpoint of the exhibition of conscious experience with this, uh, with the contemporary AI approaches? So if you see the, the machine learning and deep learning, they are kind of subdomains within AI. So machine learning is generally defined as a discipline within AI that teaches computers how to make predictions based on data. And the computer scientists, they found a way to mimic the human brain inside the machines. Uh, it's not a very accurate statement, but more or less, because that's what they call it as artificial neural networks. And the goal of using these neural networks is to approach and solve general and complex problems. Uh, that is similar in a way how the brain functions. Um, one of the, the key difference between like the classical programming versus the machine learning is that the classical programming generally works with rules and data and generates answers. Um, but in the case of machine learning, the data and answers, they are fed and it generates the rules. Uh, so, so in that sense, like um, the usual way the computer do useful work is to have a human computer, uh, sorry, human programmer uh, write down the rules, which is basically the computer program. And they, they are um, followed in turn by the input data to provide um, appropriate answers. So these rules are the algorithms, right? And that's the so data and algorithms, they come together to generate answers. But machine learning turns this around. The machine looks at the input data and the corresponding answers, and then figures out what rules should be. And therefore, machine learning in that sense is actually a trained uh, entity rather than an explicitly programmed entity. Um, so this just kind of shows that how AI over a period of time has gone through different phases. Actually, two times it was uh, went through a very, very um, down phase and then it came up again. So what changed the equation these days is basically the proliferation of data and then at the same time, very high compute um, power. So the typical way in which the, the machine learning um, examples, they look is that 
uh, like a classical example of what it is capable of doing is to distinguish between a dog and a cat. So by feeding hundreds and thousands of photos of dogs and cats, uh, we can teach the, the neural network. So basically we can train up the neural network to learn to distinguish between these two animals. The cats can have smaller variety of sizes, for example, the dogs can have larger varieties. And just by observing these things uh, about the data and comparing the labels and receiving feedback, it will eventually learn the, these features on its own and be able to distinguish between these two. So you can see that it is able to report these things, but again, the, the substrate in which these things are happening, they are all low level operations. And there is no exhibition of conscious behavior there. The problem of conscious um, awareness still remains. So it is not, in fact, the objective of the deep learning is not to necessarily uh, generate the, the conscious awareness, but we are saying that hypothetically speaking, if we were to synthesize, would we be able to synthesize? Unfortunately, no, because these are still operations at the lowest possible level where we saw that there cannot be any conscious awareness. So what is the Vedic um, alternative now? Um, so, so the basic idea here is that, that we are now thinking of conscious self as a complete sentient personality. So the natural way of understanding the statements one and two, the natural way of understanding the statements one and two, which is these, right? Is provided by the model of the conscious self. So here, each Jivatma, uh, it's a beautiful way Sadhaputta Prabhu puts it. Um, each Jivatma is conscious and possesses all the attributes of a person, right? Including senses and intelligence. Now, this is very, very important because this is the part that is actually helping understand um, or put everything together at this point. So just as a passenger can obtain information about his vehicle and its surroundings by interpreting certain instruments within the vehicle, so the Jivatma can ascertain the, the conditions. So just as a passenger can obtain the information about his vehicle by interpreting certain instruments within the vehicle. So the Jivatma can ascertain the conditions in the body and bodily environment by interpreting the physical states of the body's brain. So by presenting the body as a vehicle, right? This enables us to understand why non-physical consciousness should be associated with this complex automata. And this also opens up the possibility that we may be able to enlarge the understanding of the conscious self by direct sensory experience. So therefore, um, we are able to satisfy at this point, both of these properties. Um, so this position of the Jivatma as the conscious perceiver of the body can be illustrated with the help of an example of a person reading a book. So when a person reads a book, what happens? She becomes aware of higher order abstract properties of the patterns of ink on paper, right? Because book has just patterns of ink, right? There is nothing else. Um, but the patterns of ink is just the ink on paper. But ultimately to make out what the book has, you have to uh, figure out the letters, then words, sentences, basic ideas and images, and themes, character description, and then you become conversant with the plot. So ultimately we care about becoming consciously aware of the plot and imagery of the story. So, so none of these abstract properties, which are basically associated with the themes, characters, plot, these are the abstract properties, actually exist in the book itself, nor is the book conscious of the story it records. Thus, the establishment of the correlation between uh, the book and the conscious awareness of its content requires the existence of a conscious person. And that conscious person is endowed with intelligence and senses who can read the book. And it is just to point out that uh, this is uh, actually closest to interactionism. And it is um, to be noted that actually Rene Descartes um, is the, you can say that his interactionism theory is, is pretty close to 
the proper understanding. The only thing is there are a couple of things that human beings, not animals, possess a non-corporeal mind. So here mind is, of course, meant by the conscious self that directs the actions of their bodies because he's not going into further any further detail than the mind, the non-corporeal mind. So if the non-corporeal mind essentially corresponds to self and that directs the actions of, of their bodies. It's pretty close to the message of the Bhagavad Gita. And non-physical entity does not have to be devoid of... Uh, no, sorry. What I wanted to say is that according to Descartes, the matter has properties of extension and location in space. But mind does not. So mind you can interpret as self. So self does not. So consequently, many people have rejected on the basis that it's very hard to see how an entity with no spatial properties could possibly interact with something located uh, in a particular position in space. So Sadhaputta Prabhu immediately points out here that we do not have to apply this restriction at all. Um, so in other words, the Jivatma does have influence on the functioning of the material body, but this influence has to be exerted in an extremely subtle way. Okay. So consciousness, it basically provides an ar archetypical um, example of, um, so I just wanted to point out here, um, the non-physical self does not have to be devoid of all physical properties. Um, we have to, we have tried to formally define uh, what is meant by non-physical here. So here, the genius of Sadhguru Prabhu is that this non-physical aspect is basically related to numerical indescribability. That it is, uh, this does not mean that the, the entity cannot have any measurable properties at all. And if we incorporate that, then everything becomes satisfied. Because here, this is an, a quote from Mundaka Upanishad, which is basically saying the conscious self is atomic in size and can be perceived by perfect intelligence. This atomic self is floating in five kinds of air and is situated within the heart and spreads its influence all over the body of the embodied living being. When the self is purified from the contamination of the five kinds of air, the spiritual influence is exhibited. The consciousness in this way provides a perfect example of numerical indescribability here. So finally, um, we are left with a challenge essentially that the physicist Eugene Wagner uh, invoked the, the principles of current physical theory um, to favor this interaction, interactionism point. That in physics, causation is never one way affair. So if consciousness is real, it must have influence on matter. And then he concludes by saying the present laws of physics are at least incomplete without a translation into terms of mental phenomena. So mental, you can understand the self. Um, likely, they are inaccurate, the inaccuracy increasing with the increase in the role um, which life plays in the phenomena considered. So, so therefore, we note that the Jivatma is said to be extremely minute in size. However, it is to be located in the region of the heart rather than the region of the brain. The Jivatma does not interact directly with the gross physical structures of the body, but rather it interacts with the subtle material elements and these in turn interact with the gross matter in accordance with the principles that are, have not yet been discovered by our current physicists and chemists. So I would like to stop here. Um, thank you so much for your kind attention. Any discussion? Thank you so much for that. Um, do we have any questions or comments from anyone? We have a couple of minutes. We could get some in if anybody has any questions or comments. Uh, Hare Krishna, I have uh, one uh, comment and it might turn into a question. Um, so the issues coming up, uh, Descartes is saying that the self, which he's um, corresponds to the mind, um, does not have uh, location in space. Um, but, but I think maybe you hinted at this, but Sadapukta certainly says extremely clearly that actually the Jivatma can have location in space and clearly it does because I'm conscious of my own body, but I'm certainly not conscious of anybody else's. Um, so can you comment on that? Yes, this is basically what is in, um, captured here. Um, so indeed, like including the location and space, um, the, the Jivatma does have the, the ability to, um, to have the property of location, 
but when it comes to understanding whether um, the oh, the jivatma has physical properties or not, that just goes into the realm of numerical indescribability. So clearly, like from the spatial standpoint, uh, the jivatma at, at a particular given uh, at a given time is inhabiting a particular body, and therefore, definitely, it has the the spatial characteristics. Oh, okay. Now, so it's now, it of course. Been... Yeah. Uh, one thing I must say that, like, obviously, the main thing is that because of the numerical indescribability, we cannot put that in physical terms, like the way we do for normal objects. That's so, so we that, can't. That is the key distinction. So we can say a jivatma is associated with a certain body, but we can't say it's exactly right here. You can't pin it down. Is that? You no, can say we can say, we can we can pin it down by saying that it's in the region of the heart. We say that, right? Yeah. So we that's... we pin it down definitely. Uh, but my point is that you you cannot locate using any physical measurable instrument just because it's going to escape any range of numerical yeah. describability. And that's where the, the point comes in, that just because it has got spatial characteristics, that does not mean that you can uh -huh, exactly. actually figure okay. out. You know, that's it. the point. Thank you. That, that was very yeah. good answer. Thank you. There any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question and I, you might have taken this up because I, I had to miss the first part, but is there any later updates to the Turing test and how does that apply? Okay, um, thank you for your question. So Turing test generally um, relates to how you can actually um, imitate the human behavior, right? And particularly the stress was, one, was on um, replicating the linguistic behavior of humans. And that, that's where the, the whole imitation game came from uh, Alan Turing's uh, thesis. So where do we stand today in terms of mimicking the, um, the linguistic behavior of humans? There had been quite a bit of progress, but obviously, um, there's a long way to go, you know, um, because of the, I mean, we know that chat GPT, for example, can really uh, these days um, answer questions, which are, we sometimes we get surprised by, <laughs> like, is it is it answered by a human being or, or a machine, you know? So um, I must say that the, uh, where we are actually discussing here, it's not so much about replicating the behavioral characteristics of a human being, but more about the uh, generation of the conscious awareness associated with uh, with that that behavioral pattern. And, and so we are not even we are not even touching in, in that area. Um, okay. I also appreciate how much preparation you've done because you've not only taken Sadaputra's work, but you've tried to bring it up to date. So well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much you. for your kind encouragement. I feel yeah. sort of embarrassed talking in front of such a <laughs> such an illustrious uh, audience. So I I depend on your blessings to be able to do any justice to this whole thing. <laughs> We have one more question from Merle, who's slightly off camera, but here at the table. Yeah, uh, no, it's it's more of a, of a comment to uh, to Brahmacharya the Um There's uh, you know different levels of of uh, AI, really. Um, there is the level of you know just like trying to imitate a human. You know, can you can you imitate somebody well enough? Uh, can can you imitate? Uh, a person well enough so that somebody could say like, oh, is this really a human like that? And then there is right. uh, um, a, uh, a more uh, ambitious AI, which is like, no, we actually want a sentient AIs, you know, uh, so, um, some uh, a robot that can actually feel, you know, emotions and 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 uh, have rationality in the way that that we experience it ourselves. So you know, it depends like where. Um, you know, to what degree you're, you're to, to whom you're talking to and where they want to take their, their AI ideas. Yes. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I wanted to say that uh, in the field of AI, I didn't mention this. Um, you know, in the field of AI, there are three other things that are going on. So one is computer vision. Another uh, is natural language processing. Um, and uh, the third one is I robotics, think, yeah, reinforcement learning. Okay, yeah. So um, each of these actually gets kind of, you can say cross product, uh, you take cross product with deep learning, right? Then each of these now have deep um, prefix added to it. So there's deep computer vision, deep natural language processing and deep reinforcement learning. Um, so the that whole linguistic behavior is basically belonging to this domain. Like this whole, um, where you, whether you can distinguish between the linguistic characteristic of a real human being versus a machine. So I just wanted to like bring that up. That I did not make that point explicitly, but it also is worth noting. Thank you for that. Do we have any uh, any last questions or comments? Yeah, yeah there. I have yeah, I have a question. Is it okay? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so my question is, how does soul, which is uh, conscious, can be aware of non-conscious things? Because soul is kind of a spiritual, right? It doesn't have anything to do with material. So how does it exactly work? Right. So we know that, um, let me see. So the soul is completely spiritual and which is what we are referring to as the self. And it is covered by the covering of the mind, intelligence, and ego, right? And then it has the covering of the gross physical body, the body made up of these elements. So the way actually um, Sadhubhuta Prabhu had explained this in this book called Maya, you know, he, he actually made a very interesting correlation between the Sankhya, Sankhya, sorry, it's not erasing, okay. Um, the relationship between Sankhya, Sankhya versus virtual reality. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the difference between virtual reality and simulation is that in the case of simulation, you're putting, um, I, you're putting a real, uh, you're putting an imaginary person in the real world, so to speak. Uh, you, you can, you're putting an imaginary entity or simulated entity into the real world. Um, while the virtual reality is other way around, you're putting a real entity in the uh, virtual world. So just like in the case of virtual reality, when you have, uh, you have to wear certain apparatus like data gloves and different, different varieties of gadgets, right? You wear, and then once you wear them, you are in a position to interact with that, that reality around, right? So the, so likewise, the soul is like a projection from the spiritual abode, right? which is wearing these kind of uh, apparatus, like the subtle body and the gross body. And this is allowing it to sort of um, have that experience of, um, of this outer reality. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is that, yes, there is, um, there is a, an interaction that is a two-way interaction between the um, the non-physical 
um, or non-material, non-material, non-physical self and the material subtle body. So there is essentially a two-way interaction between these, these two. And because of which this acts as a wire medium through which uh, it is able to influence the, the gross physical layer. Um, now, exactly how they are actually interacting, um, that is again, numerically um, indescribable. So therefore, we cannot conceive of that, you know? The, so, so in other words, we are asking a question which is very difficult to satisfactorily answer in a uh, in sort of mechanistic terms. Because we are kind of a little bit seeking a mechanistic response to this question. How is a non-material, non-physical sense self interacting with uh, something which it is not supposed to be at all, uh, you know, mixing with, right? Asango hi esha purushaha, right? That's one of the Vedic aphorism. So how is that possible that two-way interaction is going on? Now, because this is numerically indescribable and therefore it belongs to the inconceivable um, thing. I, this is how I'm thinking. I invite other participants to maybe share their thoughts. Go ahead, it looks like we have a couple uh, responses here. Um, I think the way Sadakuta generally addresses this kind of problem is to invoke the super soul, uh, because the super soul is an intimate connection to, to birds in the mm. same place. So you invoke the super soul who does control the material energy. Where mm. so actually the self, this is the way I understand it anyway, the self mm. doesn't control the material energy. Oh, I uh, but it uh, doesn't control the material energy. But super soul being so close to the soul understands the desires and then provides that which is needed. So that gives the, the, that freedom for free will. Your free will mm. is over what you desire. I want to mm. pick this up so I can do it. Um, so that's my free will is not to pick it up because I can't make my fingers move. Super soul has to do that, you know. Um, but I can at least desire. Uh, anyway, that's how I understand it. You, you wanted to add something, Marlon? Yeah. Um... In terms of things that have to do with the soul and the spirit, I I agree that these things you know can can become like absolutely numerically indescribable. Uh, like yeah, like how do you numerically describe um, you know what a what a pear tastes like? You know, it's like yeah, it's that that's not. But um, I don't think that just because uh, something is. Uh, you know, subtle in meaning the mind intelligence and, and false ego is necessarily numerically indescribable. Um, this is still material. These things, mind intelligence and false ego, yeah. they're still material. So there is a way to, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. There, there, there there's a way to uh, to uh, make them uh, more more quantifiable. Uh, and at the Back to the Institute, we are doing that. We are creating. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, we published a paper on the in the Journal of uh, of Indian Psychology, where we made a mathematical model of the gunas, and we included it within a known model for um, for, for decision making, and and, and published it. So there are ways in which we can make this mind intelligence and false ego numerically describable. But I agree with you in terms of the soul. Now we're talking about now that's a completely different realm. Uh, yeah, that there, <laughs> there you really have to invoke super soul. Yeah, thank you. Well said. Well said. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the answers. I think with that, we are probably out of time. Thank you so much, Partha, for this presentation. Um, everybody, please join us again in two weeks on Saturday, March 18th.
her presentation on Chapter 3, Dialogue on Consciousness and the Quantum by Vasil Semenov or Dvidja Govinda. Vasil has earned a PhDs in both acoustics and computational mathematics, works in telecommunication with the scientific and production enterprise Delta SPE, and has been teaching Vedic mathematics and other courses in the Kiev Krishna Consciousness Academy since 2013. So that should be a fascinating time. I hope to see you all there. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.